No thing. Well, I hope it goes quickly. So, but these are your new digs, right? Behind you, this is your new office space. Yes, this is my office. And uh, actually, here is a good view. All right. A nice view. <laughs> but it is from the window. So, uh, huh? something like this. No, it's nice. Uh, uh, yes. I'm not sure the window, but you see the nice lawn is there and the greenery. So it's great. Okay. Well, he, I've just kind of been stalling for here. Let me get the record going. Okay. Oh, I I am recording. So I've just been stalling for a few minutes in case other people show. But if it's just us, uh, then yep. they can watch the video, I guess. <clears throat> so, so uh, just quick. Uh, yeah. Maybe that. All another thing is thank you for shifting to eleven to twelve. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if everybody. Uh, are aware of this um, our change that's why although everybody may have gotten the message but uh, i'm not sure they got the uh, that message that's why today maybe uh, not everybody oh oh um let's see i emailed everyone did did you get an email yes i do okay i get that and i got also oh by the way I'm not sure my, I am actually informed by Brit. So uh, if it is from you or from the Brit, that's the question. But I got it. I got uh, the change in office. Okay. All right. So everyone, is there anyone here who was not here last week? Let's see. Patricia's logging on. Patricia, were you here last week? Uh, I was not, um, sadly. Oh. I missed the first one, but um, my co-instructor Ian was, so he kind of got me caught up on, on everything. Okay. So yeah, last week we didn't make a tremendous amount of progress. We basically did a round of introductions, and I peppered in some of the orientation introduction information in between the introductions, but we still have a bit of that to go, and we want to get to the beginning of lab one um, uh, this week. Sorry, my brain's not firing on full cylinders. I was up late. I'm just starting my coffee now. So it may take a little bit to kick in. But okay, you weren't here last time, so we should subject you to the same fun we had last time and, and have you introduce yourself to the group. Sure, give me about 30 seconds to get my camera set up and I will let you see my smiling face as well. Oh, even better. Yeah, it's always good uh, when we can see each other face to face. In the meantime, uh, let me, here, I'm gonna just share my screen now because we're gonna be looking at a lot of stuff. And um, just one other thing, uh, Patricia, when you're done setting up your camera, you'll want to go to this web page. I'll put it in the chat and add your contact information so um, you can receive the direct emails. I'm not going to email the bit. There's a big list serve with everyone who does Opus present and, and who were trained in the past and those who are working on MWU. And I'm not going to keep spamming that list serve. And so I'll just email it to those on this list. So let me find the chat here. And I'll put this link in there. So I, I've i got my name listed there in row eight. That's me. Oh, OK, great. So you're all there is one, it, yes. But we missed your introduction, so do tell. All right. So um, hello, uh, my name is Patricia Craig. Uh, I'm a teaching associate, um, which is just a fancy name for instructor uh, with um, Coastal Carolina University. Um, I'm teaching an introductory uh, planetary astronomy and an introductory um, stellar astronomy this semester. Um, what I hope to get out of this um, training is to be able to give the students um, sort of a real world 
you know, observing experience. I mean, we have, we set up telescopes uh, a couple times during the semester and have, you know, observation nights, but, um, you know, to, to have them actually log into a real um, telescope network, you know, request observing time and then get, get data that they actually took that I think means, you know, so much more. Um, and then being able to, you know, do certain, um, exercises like I mean I've, I've kind of watched some of the the YouTube videos on on some of these um but but yeah I'm, I'm excited to get this um get this set up excellent excellent okay and so you're teaching it this semester as you're learning it the same time right right yes we <laughs> hope to we hope we have a, a short lab or short lecture day um in about two and a half weeks um because the, the first day of classes for us is today um so nothing's you know happened yet but um in about two and a half three weeks um we have a short lecture and we're hoping to be able to introduce them to the skynet setup and get them registered and everything uh during that time and at least get them like i said kind of you know registered and show them how to how to re um, request images and whatnot and maybe set it up as either like a couple of week long things or maybe even like a semester long project. All right. Uh, excellent. Okay. Uh, let's see. So last time we spent a lot of time doing introductions and we didn't get through much of the orientation material. I did sprinkle uh, a bunch of it you know, as we we're doing the introductions as things came up. I sprinkled some of it in. Let me try to run through the rest of it quickly. So that was the email list. If anyone else pops in who's new, we'll want to make sure we add them to the email list. And I'll put links in the chat as we go. And as I'm going through, please just, I, I don't monitor the chat. I, I'm very bad at that on Zoom. I can't multitask like that. So just speak up. Uh, monologues are boring, but discussions are fun. Even though it slows things down, it, it, I think everyone gets more out of it from a discussion. So I sent this around before. This uh, is Dan, be sorry, um, just please. before we get started, one more thing. I um I have a physics class I have to teach at noon Eastern. So if I have to bug out a few minutes early before you guys are done wrapping up, don't please don't take offense. I just have to go do a class. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, I understand. Uh, okay, so I just put this one in the chat, and it is uh, this is where we're going to collect the videos from this semester. And so, you know, if you have to bug out early, you can always come to the video and, and catch out and uh, catch up on what you missed. And I've sent this one around before as well. These are the videos from last semester. So if you happen to get ahead of our training, it's always a little challenging doing the training uh, the same time that you're offering it. You know, if you're offering it for the first time and just receiving the training now, uh, timing can be a little tricky. At UNC, it's kind of good um, in the sense that all of our vacations, uh, the breaks in the schedule are kind of front-loaded. Uh, we have, um, of course, Labor Day, and then we have a Wellness Day after that, and like University Day. And, and so a lot of our breaks are early on. So I know I will be ahead of my schedule at UNC, but I may not be ahead of your schedule. And you may just have to jump ahead a little bit until we catch up during the during our weekly meetings and um, i'll put that in the chat and now i should point out when i and i mentioned it when i uploaded the video last time i'll just load it here it's on mute i included a whole bunch of these links here maybe it's not a, an exhaustive list and i'll put them in the chat today if i remember but there's a whole bunch of links here as well okay um, MW, so I'll get to this in a second. I just want to give you a little, I'll try to keep it real quick, history of how this started. Uh, in 2008, I was named the director of introductory labs at UNC Chapel Hill. At the time, uh, the labs were a mixture, I think I went through some of this last time, a mixture of night labs, which the students really abhorred. They didn't like coming in at night. Um, for various reasons, I guess. And um, often the night labs, no, sorry, I'm getting coffee here. Sometimes my heart races and hits me at random times. I just need to take a moment to catch my breath. 
Okay. So uh, the night labs were often weathered out. The, the weather in Chapel Hill is not always ideal. Uh, snow, clouds, etc. And so we had a set of backup labs that were pretty abysmal. Uh, things like, here's a scan of a fax of a copy of a photo of the moon measure crater. And so they weren't the most popular labs. Uh, maybe they got one or two nights outside with small telescopes, uh, but they're spending all their time fighting with the telescopes. And we talked about this a bit last time, that um, the goal of Opus is not so much, you know, it's a philosophical choice that fighting with telescopes, that's an important thing for majors to learn, but not necessarily for survey students to learn. We want the telescopes to just work so they can get on with the science. Even so, the kinds of activities they were doing with small telescopes did not reinforce the lack of what was being taught in class uh, very well. In class, we tend to teach the greatest hits the past 400 years, and those are very hard to replicate with small, very small campus telescopes. So it wasn't a great connect you know, when they could even use the telescopes and when they would even work. The other set of labs we had were in our planetarium. We have one of the best planetariums, the largest planetarium in the southeast of the country. The Apollo, Gemini, Mercury astronauts all train there. So it's a pretty cool thing. And being in a planetarium is cool, and it's not fully digitized. Uh, so it's a great experience. I try to arrange a free show for my students every semester. But the kinds of activities you can do in a planetarium chamber also don't connect very well with introductory curricula. It's like sit in a chair and measure angles with your hand, but if you change your chair, you may develop 100% error because the dome's not really at infinity. And uh, after, so I was named uh, director of intro labs in 08. I saw all the problems and so immediately got to work developing the new Opus curriculum, making use of the Skynet telescopes, which we started building in 04. Uh, so we had a little bit of head start on the technology, and so we started developing the curriculum then. We introduced them in 09, and over the next five years, our enrollments, not just in the labs, but all of our introductory courses, went up 100%. And the labs more than 100%, but across the entire introductory curriculum, about 100%. And many students came back for more. Uh, they really liked the labs, and so this convinced them. Many of them were not planning a STEM career or taking any other STEM courses. They came back for more. We'd take um, like a second semester astronomy course on stars, galaxies, cosmology. And from there, we would take the best of those students and take them to our summer program in Green Bank, West Virginia, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory which Britt can attest is super fun and they all come back and become majors. And so our majors increased about 300% or the AstroTrack majors uh, from about 10 per year to 40 per year. At that point, we knew we were on something, uh, that we had hit something. Uh, another indicator was in the Opus Labs, the students were taking their pictures and posting them on social media, uh, writing things like coolest homework, best homework, uh, I've ever gotten, and how often do students take their homework assignments and rave about them on social media? So we we knew both from the numbers and from this uh, kind of the social media response that we were on to something. So we uh, packaged it, sent it to NSF uh, as part of their twos program, which is, I don't think they offer it anymore, but it's a kind of a starter educational funding program got 300K uh, between us and Wake Tech Community College. And um, about a dozen, even though they weren't part of the proposal, about a dozen institutions joined in. And so it was pretty exciting. It was the beginning of the building of this community that we've put together. And not only did they learn the labs, uh, we did some preliminary education research. Now, being a small budgeted grant, I couldn't hire the real deal, uh, so I had to do it myself. And I focused on attitudes, which I now know is the hardest thing to measure. Things like self-efficacy is uh, much, much easier to measure. But um, we tested a dozen course components, and only two 
uh, were shown to improve student attitudes. Of course, we measured learning gains as well. But my philosophy there is learning gains, you know, the education, this is a bit of a tangent, but um, in the education research world, there's been a huge focus on learning gains. And it's primarily because it's the easiest thing to measure. You give them a content knowledge test beforehand, a content knowledge test after, and you can measure the learning gains. And then you can study, well, if I do these active learning techniques, do I boost these learning gains more? And learning gains, don't get me wrong, they're important. Um, if, you know, particularly for sequential courses, like if you, once you get in the major, you must know this stuff for the next course to make sense. And then you must know that stuff for the next course to make sense. So using techniques, doing things that boost the, what they learn and what they retain is critically important. But um, I've always been of the opinion that's less important at the introductory level, at the survey level. Most of these students are never gonna come back and take another science course. Uh, at the same time, it's a large pool of students. So if we can inspire some, we can turn them into maybe not astro majors, but STEM majors. So it's a real opportunity, but the focus should not be learning gains. It should be things like boosting self-efficacy, boosting attitudes. Uh, if we boost STEM attitudes when they go off into the citizenry and vote, uh, they'll vote positively on STEM issues, hopefully. If we can boost self-efficacy, which is convincing them that yes, I can do this, uh, that could have impacts on what majors they take and career intentions. So I started focusing on attitudes and of the 12 course components we tested, the Skynet-based labs, and we also tested non-Skynet-based labs, they did not register, but Skynet-based labs were one of two components that boosted attitudes. So um, that was pretty exciting as well. So uh, after that, just to keep running through the history, uh, try and keep it quick, uh, went to a conference in Hawaii, uh, the Robotic Telescope Science Research Education Conference run by Michael Fitzgerald, who's probably the foremost leader on education research in astronomy uh, out there today. Um, uh, a great guy, and um, I've worked with him since, and he's been a pleasure to work with. Uh, it's you know his conference, and I went out there trying to build a large consortium so we can go back to NSF with these results and ask for a lot of money. And uh, we did that. I got about three dozen institutions on board. They wrote letters and nothing looks better than that when you're applying to NSF to have three dozen institutions saying, yes, we wanna do this. Uh, normally it's just you trying to make a case, but to have that kind of backing is really powerful. So we submitted. We proposed to take the Opus curriculum and expand it to a national level, meaning in this case, about three dozen institutions, and to start developing a follow-up curriculum called Astrophotography of the Multi-Wavelength Universe, or MWU. The idea is at UNC, Opus convinced them to come back for more, it would take them on a field experience to Green Bank Observatory, blow their minds, and they became STEM majors but field experiences don't scale. So if we can capture some elements of that and bring it into the classroom, uh, maybe they come back for more, they take this astrophotography course uh, where astrophotography is not the point, it's a hook to teach them about emission mechanisms and multi-wavelength observations, optical, radio, infrared archival, and um, hopefully then seal the deal and convince them to become majors. So we submitted the proposal. They said, we love it, but it's too big. Break it up and try again next year, which is what we did. We broke it up into 1.85 million for Opus and a $300,000 starter grant for MWU. Uh, they said, these are both great proposals. Um, both are eligible for funding, but you can only have one. So we took the bigger one, uh, the 1.85 million for Opus. You're participating in that now. Um, the MWU one uh, that was not funded, come back to that in a second. But I want to show you some of the on Opus. You know, I've talked about self-efficacy, attitudes, career intention, and learning gains. And with this kind of money, we were able to hire an education research team. 
So let me just put up some preliminary results. Uh, this team is great. Uh, education research, I've always, prior to working with them, had the opinion that this was a bunch of BS. Um, you know, anyone can make surveys and, and, and it's very soft science and you can make it say whatever you want, was my opinion. But now that I'm working with this particular group, Michael Fitzgerald, David McKinnon, Rachel Freed, uh, their post, well, she's not my postdoc, she just got her PhD under them. They're good. Um, and they, they have the same attitude that I do, that most education research is total BS, but um, uh, they have a degree of rigor that I really appreciate, both on the quantitative and qualitative sides. You know, we hit both of those. Rachel goes and you know, if you become an Opus adopt, adopter, Rachel will visit your classroom, not to um, evaluate you, but to study your particular implementation because they're all unique. And then the surveys, they call them instruments. It took me a while to learn all their terminology. Uh, they don't just make a survey and use it. It goes through all sorts of rigorous statistical tests to show that it's measuring what it's measuring. It has good statistical properties. You can draw conclusions from, et cetera. And they've been publishing exploratory factor analyses, confirmatory factor analyses, multivariate analysis of the results in PRPR, which is one of the leading education research journals. And I don't want to eat up too much time, but I just want to hit this highlight. This is the self-efficacy result, which, as I was saying, this is probably the leading indicator of whether you can turn someone into a STEM major. You know, astronomy is this great opportunity. It's intrinsically interesting. And it leads to all the other sciences. In introductory astronomy, we're talking about physics, chemistry, biology, geology, data science, engineering, computer science, it leads to all the other sciences. It's a gateway drug uh, for the sciences. So can we boost self-efficacy leading into, because if they, they don't have self-efficacy, they don't believe they can do it, they won't do it. So uh, they made two instruments. One measures their self-efficacy about their astronomical knowledge and one their self-efficacy about their instrumentation, ability to use scientific instrumentation. And pre and post results, you can see them in the plots here, how the numbers went up. And those numbers are effect sizes, the number of standard deviation they pushed the class essentially from pre to post. And to put into context, if you can boost your group by 0.2, that's negligible. 0.5 is moderate, 0.8 is large. Greater than one is consistent with mastery learning, where you master a topic completely, no matter how long it takes before moving on to the next. And then uh, two corresponds to one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which of course we can't, we don't have the luxury of doing. Uh, this is a mass produced curriculum. Despite that, we are getting results between about one and a half and two, and at some individual institutions as high as three, which in the education research world is you know, mind exploding. So this curriculum really seems to work in building students' confidence that they can do STEM. And one of the most exciting results to me is you see on each of these plots, there are two lines. The dashed line is, is male, the solid line is female. When they start out, there's a gap. This is the well-known con uh, gender confidence gap in science. And you can see by the end, it's all but closed. So uh, this is the study, you know, as you're offering Opus, we mentioned before, you'll be carrying out a uh, pre and post surveys of your students. Uh, they're also content knowledge gains. They're, they're moderate to large, uh, but this is the headline result. And, and this is what part of your financial compensation is for, is to carry out these surveys, getting high response rates, both with pre and with post. Anyway, um, wanted to get that in. I'm trying to get these final orientation things in before we hit lab one. Uh, the next, uh, well, then back to that $300,000 proposal that wasn't funded, DOD education. Uh, put forward an opportunity. DOD has a vested interest in a STEM-educated workforce. That's who they need to hire. They have a ton of money. And so they have both three and $6 million pots. Uh, I wasn't so bold to try the $6 million. Uh, the success rate at DOD is 4%. Uh, 
NSF, it's 15%. Uh, I hired some extern some experts uh, to advise me and we did get, I went for 3 million and we got it. And that is a follow-up curriculum. It's still under development. Once you teach Opus once, you can join that group of educators. There's a lot more financial compensation for helping there. And it's coming along. This It's just beginning to be studied. But here's some examples. I'll put this link in the chat in case you want to play with it or look at it. Uh, these are We ran it for the first time at Chapel Hill, probably about a year earlier than we should have, given everything is still in development. And uh, their work products were blogs. And so here they're combining optical and radio analyses and infrared archival, and not just making pretty pictures, but learning about emission mechanisms and the role of the multi-wavelength uh, study of the universe. And these are, are pretty good. I was pretty excited for a first time out the door. And you know, here's another web page where um, before this, I was exploring and developing the new astrophotography capabilities in Afterglow, which is the image processing software we're using in Opus. Now in Opus, they just take black and white images. Uh, then uh, those who come back and graduate to this. So this is something you may want to consider in the future. It is fun to teach. It's a lot of fun to teach. I just want to mention it and point out what's going on. You know, it was a simple matter of taking the $300,000 proposal and adding a zero to the budget at the end of the budget, which um, we're using to build a global network of radio telescopes. This is the radio telescope that's already on Skynet. We're now adding three in Australia, and Australia is developing our, a new set of radio astronomy backend signal processing devices. So this is still very much in the tech dev stage, and we are currently re rebuilding the Skynet interface to handle it. This would be the last year that we use the Skynet that you're, you're about to see. But um, three scopes in Australia, 30 meters across, down to 14. We have half the time on the 14. Uh, we're going to be integrating two, th three to five more in the U.S., maybe one in Canada as well. So that's stuff that's coming. And I, I like to preview some stuff that's coming. Okay. But now to the real reason you're here. And, and I'll pause for a second. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Uh, not here. about any of that, Dan, but I, yeah. I did have one question. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I had to join late because there's some. IT chaos here on the first day of school. <laughs> um, but uh, I, when I looked in the Cengage, I noticed that it looks like, and maybe it's just for me, that lab three and lab four are identical. Looks like lab three was copied into lab four. And I don't know if anybody else saw that or that's just something I need to get my Cengage rep. And this is in the section I created for you? I think so, yes. So like when I click on lab four. Okay, so I'll show you all. There was a mistake when I copied them all. Labs three and four have a later start date. Uh, it's something when you're setting your schedule you want to fix. Um, so I'm clicking on all right now. Come on, web. <laughs> there we go. Three and four, three is Galilean revolution. That's what it looked like. Okay. And then yeah. when I, if I, if you click on four, view for four. Cosmic no? distance. Well. So it may, may have been something where it didn't, because it loads it in the same. I did the, exactly the same thing last night <laughs> for well, whatever reason um you uh this one must have popped up in front of your window so you had me frightened for a second there but it i think it's okay well okay thanks dan i'm sorry to disrupt oh, the not a problem process. i appreciate interruptions because otherwise it's a monologue and when delivering a monologue you never know if the audience is interested or bored so conversation's good Okay, next I want to do just a quick overview of the Opus sequence 
and uh, then we'll quickly get into lab one, week one. So the OPA sequence, uh, this is an older web page. We offer this also to the general public uh, that they can do it at uh, self-paced and then we send them a little certificate and they can do it tuition free, right? So they just have to pay the web assigned administrative fee. But this is the flow of OPUS. Lab one, which runs as a two week lab, is kind of an introduction to the technology. Um, they're gonna learn how to use the telescopes, how to schedule observations on the Skynet interface, how to check what comes back, see if it's good or bad, whether they need to resubmit. These are real world telescopes. So I'd say about 20% of the observations do need to be resubmitted. And that's just uh, any professional astronomer, it's the same, same way. Um, particularly if you're working remotely, weather and all sorts of things. And the second week, once they have their images, they learn um, many aspects of how to process them in our Afterglow software that uh, we've built, funded by NSF and, and now DOD. Uh, things like, well, we'll go into it more detail, but they're developing a basic toolkit that they'll be able to use for the rest of the lab. They're imaging a bunch of solar system targets, a few deep sky objects. The targets are more for fun, um, and they're trying to build up the toolkit to observe and to process and analyze images. Then they put their observations in for lab three, which takes some time to collect. Um, you only need five, six, seven observations for lab three, but we have them put them in two weeks early and try to collect two weeks of data and uh, consider it a victory if they get half that. Uh, so they put it in, and while that data is being collected, and again, at every institution, you can pick and choose. You don't have to do the full sequence. We do lab two, and there are two versions of it. There's This is a non-Skynet lab, and our philosophy was not, we have these toys, what can we do with them? Our previous labs were that way. We have small telescopes, we have a planetarium, what can we do with them? And what we could do with them did not connect well with standard introductory astronomy lectures. So instead we took standard lectures and said, what are the key lessons that we want to reproduce in the lab? What's the best way to get at them? And often, most of the time it was Skynet, but not all the time. And this is an example of a non-Skynet lab that we, we kept in the sequence. Uh, understanding Earth and seasons, it's a big push in astronomy. I have my own little um, thoughts about it being overemphasized compared to other things. Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the last meeting, so I won't go on that philosophical rant. But uh, we have one that uses models like a globe, a ring light that's 12 inches like the globe, so you get uniform illumination. And they measure things like length of day. They measure uh, sun elevation. And they do this for a whole bunch of different configurations, uh, different seasons, and, and different latitudes. And they really intuit, by the end of this, they intuitively understand the concept of how length of day and sun elevation at midday changes with season, changes with latitude by taking a whole bunch of observations and plotting them and drawing conclusions. I like the globe and lights version. It gives you this God's eye perspective. It's easier to visualize the geometry. But most people don't have these setups. They take about $80 to make um, particularly if, if you have many in the room. Britt, I see your hand. And you're muted. Sorry. Um, I wasn't really sure when to ask this question, but to go back just a little bit um, before you go farther, you said we want to submit observations that they'll need for lab three a week in advance. I actually do that one two weeks in advance. Two and weeks in advance. So practically speaking, so we're not planning to do this lab two. How would you recommend that we space things? We have other labs. Yeah, you may want to insert uh, a, a traditional lab in there, um, or uh, you may want them to put the observations in at the end of lab, uh, like the second week of lab one or something. Okay, and do they need to access labs, like start reading into lab three to know what to, to request? Yep, so often at the beginning, um, the instructor or the TA in my case, uh, gives a pre-lab talk, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and going over the stuff that they're going to do. And But then before starting, we say, okay, everyone open up your laptops. We're going to put in the observations that we need for the next thing. 
and I, I'll show you a little planning document that we provide okay. students so they um, submit them early enough. But I, I found it's not good to leave it up to the students to just remember to do this on their own. So after doing my pre-lab talk, that's when I have everyone put the observations in for the next thing. So they have no excuses. It will be ready. Um, yep. Okay, thanks. Now with the globe and lights version, I prefer that one, but we also built a Stellarium version that most people use um, because they may not have the funds or or they haven't yet built the globe and light setup setups. Again, I prefer the God's eye view compared to the ground view, but you know, we figured these things out from standing on the ground. So there's value to it as well. And I'll go through these in more detail each week as we do them. Lab three, this is Galilean revolution. And so there's a part where we show that we live in a heliocentric universe using phases and sizes of Venus. It's actually a smaller part uh, near the end. Most of the lab is dedicated to Kepler's third. So they've by now monitored a moon going around a gas giant, whichever of the gas giants is available. You can do this if multiple are available, they get to pick their pluses and minuses to each that we'll go through. And we and then in the afterglow environment, they'll measure the distance between the planet and the moon in each frame. And then we have an application that we built that allows them to fit um, an orbit, measure a semi-major axis, a period, and calculate the mass of the central object. Okay, there's that one. Then we get back into the cosmic distance ladder. At the end of lab two, they measure the size of the Earth, which is the basis of the cosmic distance ladder. And the cosmic distance ladder has many rungs, but we boiled it down to the absolute key ones. And, and the first one is, of course, parallax. And we start this one with a manual exercise. You can see a student here measuring the distance to a, um, a, a measuring the angle to a distant water tower or smokestack on a closer building. And then he moves to the other side of this deck and makes a measurement. And it's nice having that manual aspect. But then we go to astronomy and using Skynet telescopes, they observe a main belt asteroid, both from the North and the South simultaneously. because so we have telescopes all over the world. It's a tricky observation. We only put in one per lab and everyone shares it. Um, and there are quite things that we're studying about, does that have the same positive data ownership effect if it's shared amongst the class versus taken by a student. But this one's tricky enough, the instructor will put it in, you put it in in front of the students so they share in the process. And the trick is getting the two Skynet telescopes to observe simultaneously. But if you do this, you can measure the distance to the main belt asteroid. Then using archival data, they do it to Venus to get the AU and to Alpha Centauri using the AU so that we do solar system, Earth baseline parallax, and then stellar parallax. So we're getting farther and farther out. Lab five, we switch over to standard candles. There used to be, um, in the distance ladder between these two, there is spectroscopic parallax, but because of Gaia, that is no longer critical. So we skip over it in the interest of simplification. And we teach them how to use our Lyries, which are good in the galaxy, Cepheids, which are good to nearby galaxies, and type 1As that are good farther out. The class, it's a big data set, so the class collects a single data set on an R Lyrae in a globular cluster, and then they all individually use that data to measure the distance to the globular cluster. Then we give them a Cepheid to a nearby galaxy. Um, if you want to go to nearby galaxies outside the local group, it has to be luminous, and luminous Cepheids are long periods, so 60-day period, that means it has to be collected archivally. You know, they have to use it archival. They, they can't wait two months in lab for that. So we provide the R library they collect as a class, but the Cepheid is archival and the type 1A supernova is also archival, but it comes from Prompt. Prompt discovers these all the time. In the future, we're hoping to use the most recent one. So it's a little bit more interesting, but right now it's a standard archival one. And they're getting farther and farther out on the rungs of the cosmic distance ladder. We then have an application lab. You don't want to do lab six without lab five. This is the great debate of 1920. It's one of the key things that you teach in introductory astronomy, uh, the size and scale of the Milky Way and our place in it and how it compares to the other galaxies back then called spiral nebulae in the universe, the Curtis Shapley debate of 1920. And so using their knowledge, we give them like 30 
uh, globular clusters and basic information uh, about the R. Lyrae, and they calculate their distances. And using one of our apps that we've custom built, they make a top-down map of the Milky Way and learn both the size of the galaxy and our place not at the center, our distance from the center. And then they image some spiral nebulae. In every Skynet lab, they're imaging something as part of the lab. Uh, they image some spiral nebulae nearby galaxies, measure their angular extent. We give them a Cepheid in that galaxy. They get the distance and then the physical size compared to the Milky Way and realize the Milky Way is not unique. The, the basic lessons of the 1920 debate. Then we have another kind of um, um, intermediate lab before we get back to the cosmic distance ladder. This is focused on the Milky Way. Here they learn how to use the radio telescope. They take spectra at different lines of sight in the plane of the Milky Way, 12 different lines of sight, and we show them how to build a galactic rotation curve. Um, and, and so they measure uh, the mass distribution of the Milky Way. It does involve a little bit of trig. It's the one place that we go above algebra, but they don't really need to understand the trig. This lab's kind of unique in that it's radio, it's spectroscopy, instead of having them look at hydrogen lamps, uh, this is way cooler. It's just radio spectroscopy. Um, there's a lot of background, but the execution is pretty simple. We throw in the LMC and SMC, and so they can get a taste of dark matter. Dark matter is the carrot. The eighth, but currently final, but soon not final lab, is Hubble's Law. This is the very top of the distance ladder. It's calibrated by the type 1A supernovae. How each one calibrates the next is one of the lessons. Uh, this lab I made myself, it uses just rubber bands and a few basic supplies, and they put some evenly spaced dots that are galaxies. It's a little one-dimensional universe. They can expand it and with godlike power, stop time and make measurements between the dots. And you can actually rebuild Hubble's law, velocity versus luminosity distance, just from the measurements. Then we have them do a decelerating rubber band and an accelerating rubber band, and they get Hubble's laws that curve at the upper end, they compare it to the type 1a supernova data and conclude we live in an accelerating universe with dark energy as the carrot. And then the final lab, uh, which I'll be writing this semester, it won't be in web assigned form, but if I have a draft in time, you're welcome to use it in just kind of PDF form. Um, we go back to the radio telescope, we'll image a bunch of galaxies. I've already imaged all the nearby galaxies, got the data, know that this works. You can see the radio H1 line, the same line that we get for the rotation curve, cold neutral hydrogen, 21 centimeter line, and you can measure the redshifts. And uh, we'll give them uh, a Cepheid or a type 1a supernova in each galaxy, just the information about it. They'll calculate distances, they'll calculate redshifts, and they'll measure Hubble's constant. Uh, each student will do one of these targets because it does take some integration time with the radio telescope. And they'll put them all together as a class. As long as I avoid Virgo galaxies with uh, internal scatter, I've already tried this, you do get a very reasonable Hubble's law, something in the 60s or 70s. It's not going to be as precise as the, the pros, but uh, they're going to measure it. But in Lab 8, really, the goal is to dispel misconceptions that it's not an explosion in space, but an explosion of space and then they'll go measure it in lab nine. Anyway, that is the flow of opus. Any questions about that? Okay, let's see what's next. Um, so more resources, uh, Skynet, I'll show you that in just a second as we're going through lab one. In the beginning of lab one, it doesn't take that much time. So I, I think we'll still be okay. Afterglow, uh, if any of you've ever used um, Astro Image J, this is going to supplant it. This is the thing we're building to replace Astro Image J, be used by students primarily, but the algorithms are pro level. You can do publishable research with this as well. And it's directly connected to the Skynet database, so they don't have to download their data and re upload it. Um, you'll learn how to use this next week. And they can bring in their images and do all sorts of things photometry, angular measurements. They can do color combinations that are not part of Opus, but part of MWU, et cetera. You know, there's probably been almost a million bucks spent on developing this tech. 
in my group. Uh, the other resource that we use is Stellarium. And so on orientation day, you want to make sure they can log into Skynet, log into Afterglow, log into and download Stellarium on their machines. Uh, there are different versions for different platforms. Our experience is MacBook Pros are sometimes problematic, but if you fiddle with it, you can make it work. Um, if you run into problems, let me know. Sometimes going a version back helps, but I hear it's gotten better with in, over recent years. Uh, in terms of account creation, let me mention that now. You all have your web assigned sections created. Once you once your students have filled those up, or if you don't want to wait for that, send me a list of emails, and I will create a group in Skynet, make you the admin, and the students will receive automated emails, uh, just like the ones you received. And last night I sent, I put all your emails into Skynet and generated. Uh, Skynet accounts for you. Some of you already had them, but those of you who didn't, um, you should have received an automated email. You may want to check your spam folder, follow the directions, and your Skynet account will automatically be there and working, uh, in your case, with an hour's worth of time at a $75 value, and your students will get a half hour of time. And the most students won't use all that. Some students will use it because they've been screwing around with trying to make color pictures. And that is actually great because uh, that's your future astronomer. So don't penalize them for using all their time. I give each instructor, when I set up your section, extra time, just uh, pass some of that those credits on to that future astrophysicist. Okay, let's go to WebAssign and into lab one. I'm gonna log out for a second. Okay, um, webassign.net slash login. This is the, I'll put this in the chat. This is the way that they'll log in. And when they come here, no, I'm sorry. Initially, they go to webassign.net without the login. Just webassign.net. And they'll want to enter a class key. So as I've created your web assigned sections, I've been giving you a class key. Uh, if you log in, uh, you can find it. Uh, well, we're logged out at the moment, but once you log in, you can find it in your section. I've also uh, listed them on that sign up sheet. And so they enter their class key and it will, you know, they enter it here. It associate, associates them with their course. They have two weeks to pay or type in an access code. So there's a, a trial period and it's pretty straightforward. Um, I am just going to regular login. I have it set up for my Gmail. And being an instructor, it realizes that and it will take me to instructor view. This takes a second to load because I got like 40 sections in here since I've set them up for everyone. And so you can see all the sections here. Uh, your section's in here somewhere. Here's um, one of my sections here. And here are the the labs, and you'll learn how to use WebAssign in time. Uh, let's not make this into a WebAssign tutorial today, but let's just go straight in and get through some of this material, and then I'll just continue with the rest of it next time. So here we are in lab one. I should point out that this is the instructor view. At the top, there is a view as student, and it's a little nicer looking than here on the instructor view, but it's the same material. So I'll just show you stuff from the instructor view. At the top of each lab, we have instructions. And then after that, there's an accordion type structure. Most of them, all the accordions are in one question, but this lab is a little bit long. They had to break it into two. There's a limit of how much stuff they can put. This is considered a single question in WebAssign, although there's going to be a bunch of things in here, or at least in here. Uh, but it was convenient to break it up along the lines of week one, week two, 
where this is the afterglow stuff and this is uh, background on Skynet and how to submit an observation. And at the top, you have instructions. The instructions I can edit myself. Uh, if, in fact, if you set up your own section, the instructions, like if you copy things over, you may have to copy those instructions specifically. If I set it up for you, they'll be there. And you can go in and edit, I think. If, if not, let me know and I can edit for you. Uh, the stuff down here is a much slower process for me to have changed. Then labs one and two, I've recently done a round of updates that I think improved the lab a lot. But let's start up here in the instruction section and uh, we'll see what's here. And then maybe what I'll do is uh, skip over the, maybe we'll do the lab one stuff next time, but let, let, let's start here and, and, and make a decision then. Uh, the decision will be to look at the final resources or to start going into lab one material, we'll probably look at the final resources. So um, lab one, at the top here, we have videos. These are overview videos. We have two types of videos, overview and how-to. The how-to tutorial videos are embedded down in the lower sections. These are overview videos. Uh, students will often skip over these looking at the statistics on YouTube, but uh, they are useful and they're at least useful for you. First time out the bat, you may wanna watch them because this can give you an idea of what you want to instruct your students. There's an introduction. Each of these videos go to now a page where you can look at the original that I shot or enhanced glass education, which is uh, their experts in accessibility. have gone through all the videos and zoomed in to the key areas, put little graphics that pop up when I'm talking about something, an arrow will pop up and they cleaned up all the closed captioning. So a lot of people, even if they're not disabled, use the enhanced videos. Um, I use the original videos but uh, in this case, it's just a video of me giving uh, a two minute overview of the lab. So all the labs will start with that. Um, then here's a tutorial on the instruction section that I'm explaining now. This will only appear in lab one. And then an overview of the background sections where I go through and I discuss what's in the background section since students don't read anymore and an overview of the procedure section broken into two weeks here. And these can be a little bit longer, 10 to 20 minutes. And then there are some important notes and I'll show you notes for lab one and lab two. Here in lab one, uh, the key note is not all of the objects, these are solar system objects primarily, they're not all going to be observable. At any time of year, the sun makes half the sky bright. Students don't necessarily realize this. And, and so some objects you just can't observe. And so it's impossible to get all the points, 134 points. Getting 80 out of 134 may mean you're the best student in the class, but they see that 80 out of 134, think they're a failure and drop the class. So you really wanna emphasize that don't panic about the 134. The 134 is meaningless. You as the instructor have to figure out what to do here either lower the total points in the lab. I do curves, I'm a big believer in curves. Some people hate curves, but you know, whichever you want. Um, also, uh, we have them download this document. I think I already have it up. The observing guide. This is an extra document we added recently. Uh, it mentions where the prompt telescopes are. Those are the best telescopes and they should go looking for those whenever they can. And then on page two is an observation planner. For each lab, I ask them, are you doing it this semester? If so, when is it due? Subtract off this number of weeks, place the observations before this date. And those are conservative. Um, but this way they don't have an excuse when they say, oh, I forgot to submit my observations. It's all planned out here. And there are extra notes on each lab, uh, just some bonus things that may help them, links to where the, the key thing, the key videos are located and things they may wanna keep in mind. So it's a good document. It's at the beginning of every lab during your orientation section that you may have them pull it out and, and figure out those observation submission times. Let me also pull up Uh, lab two. 
so you see some of the other special things that are listed here. Again, here is the observation planner. Uh, if there are questions in the background section, we pointed out here. Often students skip the background section, which is terrible. But uh, this is just a little reminder. Hey, you may, may not want to skip it. There are some questions in there. And then this, review the answers to the sources of error questions in the previous lab. Students are terrible, terrible at sources of error. And they'll never learn from their mistakes if they don't go back and look at the answer key. After the due date, the answer key becomes available. They can go back to it. There's a button at the top saying, yes, I want to view the answers. That puts a little mark on their account in WebAssign so you know they've seen the answers in case they ask for an extension, you know. But um, really emphasize they go back and learn from their mistakes on sources of error. And then you have the final items. And I'll run through these and then we're kind of out of time for this week. Um, these are the same in every lab. It's things we've learned along the way. So at the bottom of the lab, there's a submit button. But as soon as they start typing stuff in, there'll be, both be a save and a submit button. And they can submit for individual questions, save or submit. I've set up that you can submit 100 times. And it only counts as a submission if they've changed a question. And so it's 100 times per question, 100 changes per question. No one's ever going to change their answer 100 times. Um, so I encourage them just to use the submit. If they use the save, they also have to remember to submit at the very end. Um, often when you're grading, you'll see a little warning at the top. Would you like to submit their saved but unsubmitted answers? And be sure to do that because often students will save and forget to submit. But here I've set it up such that if they want to get in the habit, they can just use the submit button every time. Also, WebAssign does not confirm. Once they submit something, it just goes back to the page. And there's no real indication they submitted their stuff. So I do encourage them to log out and log back in and just make sure everything is still there. It has something to do with how I set up the due date in time. Uh, often in WebAssign, you submit and it gives you immediate feedback. You can configure WebAssign that way. Here it's set up that they don't see anything until the due date due time because one person will go first and share all the answers. Uh, so you get a lot of questions on that. On the first lab, then they're used to it. They won't bug you about it. Enter everything to three significant digits unless specified. A lot of the lab is auto graded, making your life a lot easier, but sometimes uh, the auto grading will fail if they don't have enough significant digits. This is how to enter scientific notation. Not like this, but like this. And I intend to embed this warning throughout the labs where they actually need it as well. Because despite it being here, they often miss it. Uh, do not add units to numerical responses. I include the unit outside the box. WebAssign doesn't know what to do with the text. And if they're submitting a file, and often they will be, images do not use special characters. Those are kind of the key things. So I'll stop there. Uh, the, what I haven't done is gone through uh, lab one, week one. If you're teaching it this week, go ahead and watch the old video. It'll be the same, the same stuff. But um, next week, I'll go through uh, lab one week one and lab one week two, and I'll hit the final uh, resources that I was going to show you. Uh, basically, the YouTube site, the plotting to tool, the new plotting tool. Um, this page has lots of pretty pictures, so during your orientation session, uh, you may use these to get them excited. Uh, some other pretty pictures that professional astrophotographers have made with the same scopes they're going to be using our grading guide, and that's pretty much it. So those are the things I didn't hit. We're catching up. So um, I'll, again, I'm here until 12.15 when my TA show up. So I'll stop the share and I'm happy to stick around and answer questions if you don't have to go. I have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I'm not teaching uh, this semester. Uh, do I still have access to the WebAssign? Ah, uh, shoot me a quick email so don't forget. And 
do you have a web assign instructor account uh yeah somewhere okay i haven't used it in a few months so send me your best guess as to what it is or try logging in and um i will attach you to one of my unc sections that way you have you'll be like an instructor with no grading privileges or anything like that and that way you can see all the labs in their native environment perfect thanks Also, last time a few of you mentioned that some of you may have been interested in my generic, they're not generic, they're well thought out questions for uh, a solar system course and for Stars Galaxies cosmology course. If uh, any of you do have interest in those, just let me know. They can easily be attached um, to the web assigns that can, and to, to the lab section or set up as a separate section. So Dan, did you ever, uh, did you ever find out, I, I mean, I remember I asked you the same question this time as I guess I did last time. Did you ever find out that if if I just copied last time's any updates you make or updated? I did not find out. And I said I was going to send you the the uh, changes so you can check yourself. Okay. And um, I will send myself an email. So what I have been doing is I just been linking, you know, I've been copying existing courses, right? I just, so I just go back to my previous semester, copy existing course. And so, so I don't know if, if web assign makes updates, whether that counts or it doesn't. So these updates did not change the question structure. So I think they're automatic. Okay. Um, but again, I will send you the docs that specifically state where the changes are, and then you can go and look and see, do you have the copy with those changes? Okay. All right. And, and I just created my own email, so um, I will do it. Okay, because I still have other sections at other colleges to set up and um, that I haven't done yet. And uh, I may use what you set me up in the UNC but in that case, in the past, I haven't been giving them that just because it's like they're automatically logged in. You know what I mean? I have it in Canvas and they just click on a button and they're there because I copied a previous extension. So I don't think they have to plug in a, a code, you know. Yeah, we, we do have LMS. You know, WebAssign has LMS integration capabilities that I'm not super familiar with, though often people who are doing that set up their own sections. Yeah, that so that's what I've been doing. So I just copy previous ones and set it up so it's all integrated. Yeah. And then do you know, um, you spoke about uh, some issues with Mac and so forth. So I have had a reason it should come up about iPads. Do you know if, if people only have iPads, will everything work? I don't know. Um my experience with Stellarium is that the functionality is different on an iPad and they don't have the full when they do Stellarium, but I don't know about the rest of the labs. I know Stellarium has an issue. Yeah. Um, let me also make a note to figure that out. I, I knew the answer at one point. My, from what I recall is iPads uh, may have an issue. Um, you point out the issue with Stellarium. You know, I have students who have been scheduling Skynet observations on their phone, even though it was never designed uh, to be used uh, on a phone browser. Uh, Skynet 2 will actually be modular enough that you can use it on the phone uh, fairly easily. Afterglow uh, is, I think, the real question. Can, can Afterglow work on an iPad? Um, my programmers know, and they they tell me repeatedly the answer to this question. I just forget, so I, I'll get the answer and send it to you. Thank you, and I know I know I dominate in your time. Sorry, no, it's okay. But, I'm here until twelve fifteen. So, so the very first this semester may be the very first time I actually get a teaching assistant. Ooh. So, so yeah. So, um, so with that, um, do I just ask my rep to give them a free account? Or do I have to do something through you? Yeah, so no, no. Uh, just like you created your instructor account, they'll create theirs. Yeah. Though I think they're, 
so you have a couple options here. Uh, they can create theirs. I think they indicate somewhere that they're a TA. And, and often they'll get an account that starts with TA underscore and then their name. At UNC, I set up just a generic instructor account. So I don't always have to keep changing it. It's always there. It's mm -hmm. called um, D. Riker TA, I think. And um, I think the only trick is you have to set it up with a different email address. Both your account and this other account ha can't have the same email address. It flags in the new system. But if you can create a generic TA account, that's a nice thing because then you don't have to go through this process every year when you have new TAs. Okay, sounds good. And then on your signup sheet, if you give me their the information of your generic account, I can add your TA for you. Okay. Otherwise you can do it yourself through edit class settings. Okay. Dan, I sent you an email um, uh, during the past hour, but I just wanted to ask if anyone else had had trouble getting their Skynet accounts. I didn't get an email in my spam folder or otherwise yesterday. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you could just check to make sure my email was right in the Skynet. Um, okay, so let's let's go I, take a look at this here because you'll probably get similar questions. Um, this is the wrong, it's this one here. Okay, Skynet is here. And uh, let's see, group management. We're in the intro astro. This is my generic where I just put everyone in. I mean, you'll have your own groups uh, per class. And um, let's see, if I went to create user accounts, You should be in here. What is my your... email is weird. It's, yeah, it's a combination of my, yeah. It's a really unfortunate, impossible to read out email address. Sorry, I don't know if this is useful to anybody else, but I, I wasn't sure if anyone had gotten it or if it was just me. You will get questions like this from your students. Hmm. I didn't get an email, but that's because I already had an account with them. Yeah, if you already have an account. So it looks like I might not have done it uh, for you. Let's, let's see what happens. So it's this, this easy. You can create accounts. So I'm under group management. You'll have your own group. Create user accounts. You can do it manually here, um, or you put it here, but be sure to send invitation email to each new user. Uh, I'm going to give you an hour. Give your students 1,800 credits. Oh, uh, you didn't get one because you already have one. Okay. Um, I thought that might be the case because when I was at Yerkes this summer, I set one up, but it won't oh. have... Credits. It's here in this group as well. So uh, let's let's check out the credits. Um, I think my username is my first and last name with a underscore. Sorry to waste it's, everyone's time. No, no, yeah. it's here. Yeah, and, that's it. Okay, and the credits. There are different time accounts I use for different things. I think this is the Opus time account. You were down, there you are. Yep, you have, yeah, I, so I created it yesterday. Okay. Um, but it, it, ah, that's it. You are in the system, so you didn't get an email because it recognized you. I see, so okay. You, it, it, yeah, and, but it added your credit, so you're Great. right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Sorry to waste everyone's time. <laughs> um, no problem at all. And if you need to do password recovery, you could do it here. Uh, if you haven't used it for a long time, there's password standard password recovery when you log in. Okay, great. Thanks. Got to run. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Anything else, everyone?
All right, I'll transition into my TA meeting. I see Alex is here. Thank you. See ya. I'm gonna stop.